Hi, my name is Megan, and this is Everything Lit. Welcome to the first of my reread series. So one of my goals this year was to reread more books. Oh, look at this boy. Oh, there he is. As I was saying, one of my goals this year is to reread more. So I thought, why not make it a little vlog series? So for this first episode, and I think I'll probably do four or five throughout the year. This first episode is for Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. This is my favorite book of all time right now. Unseated the previous winner, Jane Eyre, who had been my favorite book for like nine or ten years. No longer than that like 15 years. Let's talk a little bit about my history with Station Eleven and what it's about and then we'll get into the vlog. I probably won't be starting this for a couple days because I want to start it right on February 1st. So every two years I do a reread of Station Eleven and I'm not sure why I decided that. It just has worked out that way every time I've wanted to read it. And the first time I read it was in February of 2016 and all I knew was that I had to read it for class and that was it. I knew nothing of what it was about. I just sat down and read a lot of it. I think I read it in like two days initially and was just immersed in this world. And that meant that when I had to go to work, I was just amazed by our current life and the current pleasures, the current and the current like opportunities we have. That's not the right word, but like technology, the current luxuries, that's the word I want, that don't feel like luxuries, but really are compared to past times. like you don't really think about how much of a gift it is to be able to pick up a phone and hear one of your loved one's voice or get on a zoom call and see their face like we don't think about that because we've had that technology for long enough and for young people they don't remember a time when they couldn't do that so i definitely cried over this in 2016 <laughs> and the class was amazing talking about it was wonderful and that professor has immaculate taste just phenomenal and if you go back one of the first videos i did was like a february wrap-up in 2016 and i talk about this and how i think it's my favorite book now so that's a really cool blast from the past so then in 2018 i read it in march and what was interesting about that is I was going to a friend's thesis reading back in Minnesota because I had already moved home to Michigan, but I went back for a few days. It was around my birthday and I was reading this on an airplane. And if you've read this book, you know that that's stressful and sad. And so just me crying on an airplane reading this. So then I wasn't really planning to reread it again for a while. And you'd think, Megan, hold on, 2018, every two years, did you read this book about a pandemic in 2020 and I would say yeah I sure did I everyone was kind of talking about it and they were talking about her newest book and I I gained some comfort from this I don't really have specific memories about 2020 and reading this and like feeling any sort of way in 2022 I wasn't planning to read it again but the tv show came out on HBO Max and I <laughs> got HBO Max from one of my friends at work because I was like, listen, I do not want to pay for this streaming service, but I really want to watch the Station Eleven show. It's my favorite book. Someone help me out. And they gave me their password and I watched, I want to say five or six of the episodes out of eight. Oh my God. The adaptation was so bad. Sir, what are you doing? And I don't just mean... <sighs> I'm sure a lot of people like the adaptation and there were a couple storylines that changed that I enjoyed those changes, but overall the tone, the meaning, the understanding in this book, the feeling of this book was all wrong. The tone was all wrong. As soon as they brought in children that explode, I was like, nope, this is not my Station Eleven. This is not correct. They just sensationalized the shit out of it. And that's not, 
that's not what this book is doing this book is a very quiet book it is a very nostalgic book and what's so phenomenal what's so interesting about station 11 is that it's nostalgic for the time we are currently living in and i guess i had never read that before and i i still don't think i have truly read something that makes me so nostalgic for the life i'm currently living it's just phenomenal like i was crying over electricity the first time i read this like i would go to work and just be like oh my god we have electricity i'm standing in this barnes and noble and there's a cash register that dings and i have internet on my phone and just the world felt like a miracle to me because of this book and i don't think i'll ever be able to recapture that feeling because it was so genuine and so i was so immersed in a story that i had no idea what it was about like that's one of the other things that caught me off guard it made me really love it because I didn't know I didn't know what to expect I had no idea that it involved a pandemic or Shakespeare or anything I did not read the back of the book I just was like I have to read this for class let's go and that was the perfect experience for me every two years I reread this it is 2024 it is time to reread it and I'm so excited to get into this I I also love how when you reread a book your relationship with that book changes over time and how it kind of shows you how you've grown as a person because the way that you relate to the static media changes the book didn't change you changed and i love that now this is going to be a full spoiler vlog i have already read this i really want to discuss it and make it a place of discussion for people who want to talk more about the themes and the the artistry that went into this so it's going to be full spoilers but this is a story about a traveling symphony that does shakespeare productions in a post-apocalyptic world but it travels backwards and forwards in time telling the stories of both the people in this troupe but also the people surrounding this famous Hollywood actor who dies the night that the pandemic starts and it's kind of a you know exploration of the before and the after and his death and the pandemic are synonymous to the people around him right his death was the change in the world but it was also not because it was the pandemic absolutely fascinating it talks a little bit about cults i like that part of this takes place 20 years after the like ground zero event because you get to see how society has started to like rejoin and these small communities have grown up around the survivors i i'm not gonna like tab this copy or anything but uh, it is signed and I always forget that it's signed because I got to meet Emily St. John Mandel and not just signed but like personalized to Megan with best wishes like I stood in front of her and actually it's the only time I've ever been starstruck and like known I was starstruck her book moved me so much and I didn't know how to tell her that or like let her know because like as a as a writer if someone if my book made someone feel the way i feel about this book like that's the dream that's the golden standard but you'd never know you never know unless they tell you so i wanted to be like oh my god i loved like your book made me nostalgic <laughs> for our current times and moved me and was beautiful and i like panicked i like handed her my book with my little like your name is on a sticky note on it be like hi and I just kind of stared at her as she signed because the line was moving pretty quick. And I went, I love your book. Just absolute panic. That's all I remember. And I walked away being like, oh, I blew my shot. I blew my shot to talk to her and say how much it moved me. All I was just like, I loved it. Okay, bye. Not a good, not a good moment for me. Not a good look. But I am very excited to start reading this. Join me if you want to read it with me, you know, let's go. Alright, 
it is technically the 2nd of February. I did not read much yesterday, but I did read a little bit. And I was talking to one of my friends at work because he is trying to finish Dune before the next movie comes out. And I said, oh yeah, I'm reading my favorite book of all time. I forgot that he had read The Sea of Tranquility and really enjoyed it uh, a year or two ago. And so he was like, oh yeah, that author. And I was like, yes, this. And I read him the line that when I very first read this book was like a what kind of moment because I, I didn't read the back, okay? I had no idea what this was about going into it. And so I'm gonna read you this line. It is the most compelling line in a book that I've read in a long time. And it's at the end of chapter two. So I'm only on chapter three, I'm like 16 pages in. And I have wanted to cry like twice. And I think what's sticking out to me in this read is I'm going to kind of think about Arthur and how he kind of, he almost becomes a, he does become like a symbol of the world and people grieve for the world the way that they grieve for him. And just, I think I'm, and this is because of personal reasons, but I think I'm going to be looking at how like grief the the threads of grief throughout here because like in the story itself i think that arthur we are given a person who has died that we can kind of connect to and connect that loss and that grief to when really what we're grieving is the whole world in this book i think it was really smart to not only like the world or like society is too big of a thing to is too big of a thing to grieve you know so emily st john mandel put that on a person and especially making him an actor and how that represents our current like social media like personas kind of vibe i don't want to say vibe like the personas that we put on and how our world feels faker sometimes because we have all these screens and all these distances and complications to put that on an actor because you're playing a part when you're on social media you're playing a part like youtube instagram tiktok you're playing a part every time you put out a video as real or as honest as you may be you are only presenting one facet of yourself on social media and when you're acting you are presenting a facet of yourself or of art or of the story and it's just this book is brilliant and fascinating and anyway i'm gonna read you the line that made me go ah, when i first read this there are a group of people gathered in the bar of the theater after arthur has collapsed on stage and they're talking about his ex-wives and his kids and who do they call first now that he's gone they decide to call his lawyer the bartender is like, wow, you know, that's really sad. You die and they call your lawyer. So then you get to the end of the chapter and it says, in the lobby, the people gathered at the bar clinked their glasses together. To Arthur, they said, they drank for a few more minutes and then went their separate ways in the storm. Of all of them there at the bar that night, the bartender was the one who survived the longest. He died three weeks later on the road out of the city. Like, Imagine reading that line that he's the one who lives the longest. He died three weeks later outside the city. And you're like, what's going to happen? Why did everyone die? What the fuck? Like, absolute show-stopping line if you don't know what this is about. I am so excited to reread this. Having, you know, two years of time in between the last one. So 2022 was when I last read it. And I read it because the show disappointed me so much and I wanted the comfort of rereading my favorite and the the gentleness and the kindness because Emily St. John Mandel, even just in that first chapter, envisions a world. I, I don't even want to say envisions a world because there are there are bad things that happen throughout this book and there are brutal things in here, but the characters that she decides to focus on are the kind of people who do the right thing or do the best thing or do the noble thing like opening your chapter with a man in the audience standing and running on stage to help this like 
it's just show-stopping. The whole book is phenomenal. And I think, maybe not this year, but I would like to reread The Glass Hotel because I feel like I didn't give it its proper due, right? Because I was in love with Station Eleven. I'd already read it twice, I think, by the time The Glass Hotel came out. And that was like her first book after Station Eleven just blew up everywhere, right? So I feel like I want to reread The Glass Hotel at some point. Maybe next year. I need some distance. But I also, so I have two other Emily St. John Mandel books that I would like to read, Her other, like two that I haven't read yet. And then I'll be all caught up on her backlist. And I'm just like, I, that's why I'm putting them off. I'm like, I don't want to be caught up. I want to have an Emily St. John Mandel book in my back pocket just in case. I think she's a phenomenal author. I'm so excited to read this and vlog. But I'm not going to have a ton of time to read today. This morning is probably it because a friend and I are seeing Wicked in Detroit this evening. I'm so excited. We're going out to eat beforehand. So I got to go like shower and get ready. And I'm going to try to film my January wrap up today. But it depends on how long the getting ready takes, you know. I'll probably see you tomorrow when I can read more. the end of Saturday and I am 68 pages in to Station Eleven. I am enjoying my time with this reread so much. Like there's a whole chapter just listing things that have been lost. Like no more swimming in pools in electric light, no more social media, no more avatars, no more internet like it really and I think I've said this already but it really makes you nostalgic and wistful for a time you are currently living in and it makes you so grateful it makes me feel grateful that like I have electric light I have like my tv I have the ability to just go to the grocery store and buy what I need rather than having to find it or make it so at this point, the traveling symphony has been to St. Deborah by the water and two of the people that they left behind two years ago because uh, they were going to have a baby, they didn't want to have the baby on the road, they're gone. They've mysteriously vanished and there's a grave marker with their names and their baby's name and this freaks out our traveling symphony and then after their performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream the prophet of this town has a little speech about how his people are the light and everything happens for a reason and it's really scary that's a really scary line of thought and a really scary thing to read because there is such a vacuum there is an opportunity here to make people believe whatever you want because not only has something catastrophic happened and people are going to cling to faith or try to believe that it happened for a reason even though we're 20 years later like people are still going to be trying to figure that out like why did they survive survivor's guilt is gonna come into play and ptsd so like this is the kind of scenario where cults can run rampant because there's no way to check them you have these isolated communities in the end of the world, what else are you gonna do? You know, you have to choose to believe something. What do you choose to believe? Ugh, it's so good. And we've already, we've seen the comics, the Station Eleven comics. I, some of the lines in here, if I were ever going to get a tattoo, which I never would because I'm afraid of needles and also I promised my mom I never would, but if I were gonna get a tattoo, I might get a tattoo of a line from this book. I don't know if I would get survival is insufficient because, because that doesn't... I love the sentiment, but that line doesn't speak to me as much as the line from the Dr. Eleven comics that Kirsten is carrying around. And that line is, 
I stood looking over my damaged home and tried to forget the sweetness of life on earth. <laughs> That's like this whole book, like looking out at the devastation that has happened and trying to forget what you knew before. Like, <laughs> it's so good. It's just, it's phenomenal. And you've got Shakespeare juxtaposed Star Trek juxtaposed sci-fi comic books like art the art in here is like both high and low brow quote unquote but like art is art and what speaks to you speaks to you and there's no there should not be judgment put on that i'm just having a great time oh and the way that it talks about like the lawyer calls Arthur's best friend, Clark, and then Clark starts calling Arthur's wives, and then, like, it kind of mirrors the spread of the disease, right? The way that news of his death spreads so quickly through media, but also amongst all of these people. There's a line that gets me every time. <sighs> Clark tells Miranda, who is Arthur's first wife, that Arthur has died and Miranda. Miranda is my favorite character. Like Miranda and Clark are everything. Um, but there's this line at the end of the chapter. Emily St. John Mandel does these lines at the end of chapters so well. Like it's so well structured and set up to make you keep reading. Like I'm just flying through this it feels like. But Miranda is on a beach in like Hong Kong or Singapore or something like that and Clark is in New York and the last line of this chapter is well I'll read the last two give you some context she imagined Clark hanging up the receiver in his office in Manhattan this was during the final month of the era when it was possible to press a series of buttons on a telephone and speak with someone on the far side of the earth like <laughs> you know like we take I don't want to say we take so much for granted, but we just don't think about the technological advancements that we have because we're so used to them at this point. Oh my god, this whole vlog is just going to be me being like, we have electricity, I'm so grateful to be alive. But like, really. <laughs> That's what Station Eleven does, and that's why I really do love rereading it every couple of years, just to give that, like, mental reset, I guess. And, like, you kind of get to live in a world where these things aren't possible, and you see the difference. You, like, see what it's like to only have your favorite TV shows by memory. You know, people love watching Friends or The Office or Parks and Recreation over and over and over as like comfort watches. But what if you could never, ever watch it again? You, most people don't have physical copies of their favorite media anyway. But even then, if you did have a physical copy, there's no electricity to play it. So just, mm. I am probably going to read a little longer, even though it's like one o'clock in the morning. And then I'll talk to you tomorrow. So I am about a hundred pages in now, and I didn't realize that my favorite scene happened so early on in the book. I am at the dinner party. It is Miranda and Arthur's third anniversary of being married. And this is kind of a, a pivotal scene or a very emotionally resonant scene later in the book. I just, I didn't realize that it happens in like the first third, but I guess that makes sense if there are a couple other callbacks to this scene, both in the Station Eleven comic and in Clark's section where we learn more about Clark, my second favorite character after Miranda. If it's emotionally resonant and like repeats, you do have to have it in the first, third, second, and the third to get that emotional weight. It's just constructed. This book is a masterclass in writing. Like not only is it 
emotionally resonant and beautifully written and heavy and but also hopeful. It's just done so well. And I don't know if any of you have this where you have a CD or a song that you associate with your favorites or with books that you like, or even maybe books you don't like. But I looked it up earlier. The Death of a Bachelor album by Panic at the Disco came out in Fe in January of 2016. And I read this in February and I was listening to the Death of a Bachelor album nonstop. I think it might be my favorite Panic at the Disco album. I really love Vices and Virtues. And of course, I really love the first one, the original uh, Panic You Can't Sweat Out, A Fever You Can't Sweat Out. OG Panic at the Disco fan. Okay. There are like, and part of it is because I listened to that album nonstop as I was reading this. Like, I had a CD player and I would just put it on and it would kind of fade into the background. But then every now and then you have songs like Impossible Year, like just these big emotional songs that they would come through in moments in the book where I was like, wow, this really fits. And the melancholy of impossible year and the wistfulness of that last song on the album is just it fits the tone of this book so well and if you think about the title song death of a bachelor arthur i think he is technically a bachelor when he dies because he has had three divorces so like it it just fits so well. Like that is my perfect experience is listening to the Death of a Bachelor album in full start to finish while reading Station Eleven. I just read the line, adulthood is full of ghosts and I forgot how much that is just an incredible line this um so we're talking about clark in this section and his job pre-pandemic like the book pandemic that cleared everyone out and he like fixed executives because their company had invested vino are you sleep talking their company had invested so much time in them why fire them and get someone new when they can just fix the issue whatever it may be that this person is having and he would go in and conduct interviews of their team and their bosses and and get these executives to improve and change their behavior and like coach them for a couple months so they're not like yelling at subordinates or whatever and he's interviewing this woman to try and help changed the executive who's her boss and she's talking about how you know he's joyless and you could like he might change his behaviors but he still works too much because he doesn't want to go home to his failing marriage and and talking about how the corporate world is full of ghosts and then she rephrases it and says adulthood is full of ghosts and I'm about to have my heart ripped out by this section where she talks about how people just fall into their lives and don't, they're not like fully living. They're not doing what they want to do. They are trapped in the machine. And I guess in the context of the book, it's both about being grateful and being present in your current life. But it's also, it's almost posing a question to the reader of, do you think that these people, these corporate ghosts are better off in the new world, in the new society, or did they not, like, did they not survive? I don't, but I think it is posing that question to the reader. Which world is better? Is it better to be present in a world without electricity, with so few people, or is it better to be a corporate ghost and maybe make you think about how you don't have to be either of them because knock on wood we haven't had a world ending pandemic and there's still time to make that decision for yourself i just i love this book so much and i think it's so fascinating 
I've read quite a bit since we last talked. I feel like last time I updated you, the traveling symphony had just entered St. Deborah uh, by the water, and now they have fled. The prophet has um, terrified them and pushed them out. He asked for a night with Alexandra, their 15-year-old, in the symphony and they said no and they left in a hurry and then found a stowaway girl who is 11 and she ran away because she was promised to the prophet big yikes and then as they're traveling some people from the symphony get they did they disappear and right now in the book we don't know what happened to them and then kirsten one of our main characters and her friend august get separated from the symphony. I also read the scene where they find this abandoned house that hasn't been ransacked before and it's so heartbreaking to read that section. They come upon this undisturbed house that's almost a monument to society beforehand. They find a remote or a clicker as I call it on the table. They find the parents bodies in their bed and a little boy in his bed. They've been, you know, there for 20 years undisturbed. It's so, br like this book has the sadness and the brutality that would happen at the end of the world while also being so mournful and gentle. <sighs> but I was listening to Panic at the Disco and I think if you haven't read this book and you want to, first of all, you're going to be spoiled <laughs> if you watch this whole video. But the song Impossible Year by Panic at the Disco is the perfect tone. It is the perfect mournful, wistful, brutalness. The way the horns soar in that song just listen to impossible year i don't know if i can actually pin a scene to each song in that um album but um la devotee is definitely an arthur song um he becomes an la devotee you know just another just another uh oh golden days makes me feel like it's a clark song no golden days is a miranda song who am I kidding? Golden Days, especially that, um, especially that dinner party I'm thinking of. Golden Days is a Miranda song. I don't know. I love Clark and I don't know what song would be his. Maybe Impossible Year because of the Museum of Civilization. Um, which is where the symphony is currently headed. It's a rumor that there is a Museum of Civilization near the Severn City Airport, and that's where they're all going to meet back up, or that's the plan at least. Kirsten and August don't know what's going on, but they've lost the symphony briefly. We haven't had a flashback to Arthur recently. Oh, but we did also learn that he wrote letters to his friend V back on the island and then uh, she put together a book and got it published about a week before the end of the world. So that was interesting and the way he writes about that island that he came from really there's a lot about memory in this book and what memory does and how it affects us like his memories of the island are all warm and he goes back there, but in his real day-to-day -day life as an actor, where he came from and the island he grew up feels like a dream, like he made it up because he can't recapture that. He can't go back. I mean, he, like physically he can go back, but he can't go back to how he felt about the island or what it was like when he was a child. And it's the same for the Traveling Symphony and our characters in the post pandemic pandemic world. They can't go back. The old world, our current world, feels like a dream to them. And there's no way to recapture it. And once again, Arthur is just the human embodiment of 
I wanted to say of the story, but like, duh, he's like the character that is central to all the threads happening here. But he is the human stand-in for the world and this world-ending event and living in this post-pandemic society. Ugh. The way that this is written. I wish that I could go back to my class discussion with all my knowledge of having read this five times and all my love for it and talk to those people about it again because I, I feel like my my part of the conversation would be a lot more productive because the first time I read it I was just blown away by the language and the plot and the characters and the way that this made me feel and when you are feeling something that deeply and that strongly, like, I couldn't critique this. I couldn't think about how it was put together or constructed or written. I was just in awe of it. And now I still have that awe, but I can also think a little more clearly. I was just reading part of Kirsten's story in this and I really like the multimedia aspect that parts of this take right there are chapters where the author just lists things that are different or things that are changed or things that don't exist anymore or things that happened um, and then there are sections that are letters that Arthur wrote to V, his friend who never replied. And like it says that her name is Victoria in this, but like part of me wonders if Vincent from the Glass Hotel has a connection here. So I'm definitely going to have to reread the Glass Hotel at some point, uh, maybe this year, maybe next year. There are interviews between Kirsten and this guy, Francois, who is in New Petoskey, and he's a librarian. So they do have like a library there and he is working on writing and newspapers and like, I guess, restarting the journey of like reaching out to people in further communities right because the world was insular for so long and local communities knew about themselves and then as more travel happened as it became safer to travel more news traveled i think one of the interesting things or i guess two interesting things about the way this story is told is we do see kind of like the end of the world quote unquote, in two sections. We get Jeevan's part, which is where I'm kind of getting to finally, and we get Clark at the very end of the book. And I think it's fascinating to, it kind of builds up the tension somehow. Like we know that the world ended. Hi, Callie. <laughs> we know that the world ended in the very first section. We get Jeevan like buying groceries, but then we don't get the rest of his story until like 200 pages in. Callie. I think that's a really fascinating choice. But also in this interview, Kirsten just talked about how her parents just disappeared. She doesn't know what happened to them. She imagines that they got sick at work and went to the ER. And if that was like, they call it day one in Toronto, then like they went to the ER and they died. But I was just thinking, so I read this in 2020 in like April of 2020. And for me, I guess that was the height of the pandemic because I had to go back to work June 1st of 2020. I was in office all, um, all except like three months of 2020. And not just in office, but around a lot of people. Like our team was one of the few teams in office, but we're the training team. We had to train hundreds of people. It was, I'm not going to talk about it because it was gross. What was I saying? Oh, I read this at the height of the pandemic and part of me was reassured by it because the thing about this flu in this book is that if you got it, there was no recovery. There are no people who caught it and recovered. If you caught it, you died. For COVID, for a lot of people, that wasn't true. While there were and are health complications and long COVID and lots of terrible things people permanently disabled from this disease I knew I want to say I knew it wasn't the end of the world the way it is in this book because there is recovery it was still a weird reading experience and a weird choice for me to do but 
I just, you know what I also read during the pandemic? Dur well, during work from home, I finally read Red, White, and Royal Blue, and that healed something in me. Um, <laughs> not to say this didn't heal something, but I just love this book, and I will be reading it my whole life. I feel like I'm about to get into the parts that are extremely sad. Like, oh, and speaking of the show, one of the changes that I did like in the show was in that very first episode. So in the in the book, Jeevan helps Kirsten and finds her like minder, her babysitter backstage, and then leaves her in that girl's hands. And then in the book, that girl takes Kirsten home to her older brother and Kirsten and her older brother, you know, make it through the pandemic. In the show, Jeevan ends up taking Kirsten and they go to his brother Frank's together. And I think that actually leads to one of the, like, I really like that change and the way that relationship was made central and the way it changed Jeevan's story and Frank's story. But I also did not like the change they made at the end with Frank. And then she and Jeevan find this cabin and that's where I stopped watching. I'm sure that in the last episode they probably get reunited and it's probably very emotional. I know based on the book that she probably I'm going to spoil things here, but she probably kills the prophet still in the show. But the show just you know, as soon as they had children, like the prophets, disciples, strapping bombs to their chests and blowing people up, I was like, this is not my Station Eleven. So I don't know if I'll go back and watch the show. I feel like I had like three episodes left. Kind of seems like a waste not to watch it. But at the same time, do I care? I don't know. I've hit the part of Station Eleven where I just don't want to stop. I've got about 110 pages left and this is this is the final descent. This is where I just keep reading until I'm done. So I'm going to put on um, Death of a Bachelor album and finish out this book. But before I do that, I just want to highlight some parts because I've just finished reading the part where Clark gets on the airplane and Miranda dies. and. The way, the way that this is written, Clark boards an airplane from London to Toronto, no, from New York to Toronto, and gosh, so I keep talking about things that the show does well, and that's because the show does a lot of scenes really well, but overall the arc and the tone and the mood are very different, and that's where I really wanted it to be the same. The scene where Clark's boyfriend tries to convince him not to go to the funeral because there is a pandemic happening and because Clark was supposed to go to something for the boyfriend and be his plus one. And I just remember that scene and that fight that they have making my heart hurt because I knew as a reader of the book that that was, that was it for them. But, you know, in the show... If you didn't know, you didn't know. Anyway, Clark is getting on a plane in the hours that this pandemic is starting. And I'm just going to read you a section because I think it's beautiful. Clark woke at 4 a.m. the next morning and took a taxi to the airport. These were the hours of near misses, the hours of miracles, visible as such only in hindsight over the following days. The flu was already seeping through the city, but he had hailed a taxi in which the driver wasn't ill and no one contagious had touched any surfaces before him. And from this improbably lucky car, he watched the streets passing in the pre-dawn dark, the pale light of bodegas with their flowers behind plastic curtains, a few shift workers on the sidewalks. The social media networks were filled with rumors of the flu's arrival in New York, but Clark didn't partake of social media and was unaware. At John F. Kennedy International Airport, he passed through a terminal in which he managed by some choreography of luck to avoid passing too close to anyone who was already infected. There were several infected people in that particular terminal by then. 
and managed not to touch any of the wrong surfaces, managed in fact to board a plane filled with similarly lucky people, the 27th to last plane ever to depart from that airport. And through all of this, he was so sleep deprived, he'd stayed up too late packing. He was tired and caught up in thoughts of Arthur, in listening to Coltrane on headphones, in working half-heartedly at the 360 degree reports. Once he found himself at the departure gate, that he didn't realize he was on the same flight as Elizabeth Colton until he glanced up and saw her boarding the plane with her son. And then, you know, it goes on, they say hi briefly, and then at the end, they all get diverted to Severn City Airport. And I just think that that paragraph talking about the luck and the miracle of his kind of dance through the city avoiding this flu is just gorgeous and I think one of the things that I do love about this book as well is because it's a narrative it is a story designed it has this thread of fate that these things are fated to happen or these people were fated to survive or fate stepped in so that they could be at the right place at the right time to not get it to not get sick and I think that it's easy to look at that and go the prophet's direction of we were chosen ones. This is fate's design for us is to survive and, you know, be the light and bring the light. But it's also so easy to emphasize that it is luck and it is happenstance. This book is just so beautifully written in addition to being so thought provoking. And I just... I'm in awe. I'm adoring it. I'm <laughs> I'm actually like reading another book at the same time about the red thread of fate in uh, Chinese like folklore, but I have to be reading another book at the same time because when I finish Station Eleven, it will be rough. Like it's going to be book hangover time and I have to have another book already started that I'm attached to to, you know, pull me out of that book hangover. There's another passage that I think is just lovely about Miranda and her like death by the ocean. Miranda is in Malaysia. This is where I'm at in the book. You're all caught up with me but the way that this scene is written and not only the way that it's written I just get chills. I get chills from Miranda her thought and I think I was thinking about this earlier I think I love Miranda because she's the kind of character I want to be sort of you know she travels for her job she enjoys her job and she got to experience all of these things and had art to keep her company like her art wasn't for anyone else but her art still found its way into Kirsten's hands, into, into someone's hands who it would also help and make help make meaning of the world. Miranda is on this beach. These, these shipping containers are trapped essentially off the coast of Malaysia. She's thinking about how they're kind of marooned out there, but at least they're safe. And it's too late for her to get onto one of the containers and she sees a sunrise for the very last time and those are like her last thoughts and I just think it's beautiful. I'm not actually gonna read it to you but it's gorgeous. Miranda is who I want to be but Clark is probably who I am. Like he gets caught up in this desk job and this life that he doesn't really care about and that person who calls says that adulthood is full of ghosts really you know it kind of horrifies him because he's like I'm a ghost too. Like this isn't what I wanted out of my life. And I think the way that Clark's mind works in some of these sections is the way that my mind would work. So this summer I uh I had some bad news and my first thoughts or maybe not my first thoughts but some of the things that I kept thinking were like this is the last time I saw that person. These were the last things that we said, you know. Those lasts were the first thing that I thought of. And Clark when he realizes you know, they're in the airport and the, the world has ended. There's this section that says, he'd known for a long time that the world's changes wouldn't be reversed, but still the realization cast his memories in a sharper light. The last time I ate an ice cream cone in a park in the sunlight, the last time I danced in a club, the last time I saw a moving bus, the last time I boarded an airplane that hadn't been repurposed as living quarters, an airplane that actually took off, the last time I ate an orange. like. Those are what my thoughts would be. 
Like when I lived in England, I thought about root beer a lot because they don't have root beer over there. And I just thought, man, I can't wait to get home and get some root beer. I can't wait to eat an American burger. Like there were things that I missed about home and this post-apocalyptic world would be just like that forever marooned forever separated from home and that's what station 11 miranda's comic is about these people forever marooned forever wishing for something else and like that's what the woman who talked to clark was talking about these people who are living lives that they're not grateful for their lives because they have this idea of this other life they want or other life that they should have and they're always wishing for something else wishing to be somewhere else and i don't have a point to all of this but like there are some books that are so preachy about being in the now and living your life to the fullest and being grateful for what you have and grateful for your you know your time in your life and your health and whatever and when they get preachy like that I get defensive like you don't know me you don't know what I'm going through you don't know what I should be grateful for but I think station 11 is such a thought experiment it's not telling you you should be grateful for this it's showing you the different ways that things can be whether you're grateful or not and I just love it I just love it so I'm gonna go finish this book in a marathon and I haven't read it too often because I don't want the emotional impact to wear off but I remember crying when Miranda died the first time I read it and maybe the second time I read it but I, I don't usually cry but I do get chills and I feel like I will probably cry in Clark's section because Clark always gets me and it's toward the end of the book. So all the emotions that have been gathering into a storm are released at the end of the book when the threads of fate bring them all together. So I'm going to listen to Panic at the Disco. And actually, the Death of a Bachelor album is only like 40 minutes long. So I'm probably going to end up listening to it twice as I finish this book. And I can't wait. So, see you on the other side. She got me again. The ending of this kills me. When we get that last day in Arthur's perspective, and it's not only his last day, but the last day of the old world, after we've already traveled this journey with Kirsten, Oh, and the soundtrack, you know, Death of a Bachelor, it ended on Impossible Year right as I hit the ending where Clark sees the station or the Dr. Eleven comics and recognizes the dinner party that we got in the first 150 pages. Oh, did not expect to cry um, over the ending again. I don't think I cried over it last time I read this, but things have changed and Arthur dies on stage of a heart attack. What a beautiful book. I don't have anything else to say about it right now. What a beautiful book. Final thoughts on Station Eleven. It's been a day or two. I had to let it, I had to sit with it for a second. I don't know how to talk about this book more than I already have. I think that this is just so fantastically written beautifully empathetically imagined. I was thinking about this story the other day and how hopeful it feels despite it being about the end of the world because what it's really hopeful about, what it really is talking about is how life will continue. People will be people even at the end of the world and will always have art. Art will always, art will survive in multiple ways and that humans will always create art and art can help you understand trauma and deal with trauma. Like the phrase that is repeated, survival is insufficient, is about you can't just be surviving. Humans need to create, need to express themselves. You know, we've had cave paintings from hundreds of thousands of years ago. If we have art that has survived the decades, because humans will always create to try to connect with one another. I also love the centering of Arthur and the way that 
even when people have lost everything, there is still more to lose. And thinking about Clark is really interesting because you have Clark in the before times in our modern day who like loses himself in the corporate machine. And we're shown how actually at the end of the world, he is able to reclaim himself, even though he lost everything there was something to gain from this. And I think with August and Kirsten and their storyline and being so young, yes, August lost his television and his beloved shows and, you know, they lost their families, but they gained this, their artistic, you know, community. There is so much loss, but there is still more after the loss. I really want to get like a special edition or something but like my copy is getting so like beat up this is my signed version though and you know what's really interesting i always think that this book ends when clark takes kirsten up to the top of the control tower at the severn city airport and shows her that a town a little ways away has electricity again civilization will persist people will continue to kind of get back what they lost or reinvent new ways to connect and i always i always think that that's the last scene but i forget that we end with Arthur. like we kind of end with arthur there's a chapter about arthur's last day which was hard to read and beautiful and that's part of what makes me cry is just like he was so ready to change he was so i don't i don't want to say happy but he was so happy that day he was ready to change and change everything and instead of him changing the world changed we have the final scene which is with clark actually and reading miranda's station 11 comic where he sees that dinner party that he was at and it just it makes him emotional because he was there and he existed and that's embodied it's remembered in this art and like it almost in that last scene you feel how art is the way that humans show that they existed like that's it's not just about being remembered because most of the people who read the Station Eleven comic don't even know who created it Kirsten who loves it so much doesn't know who did it I'm I'm getting emotional just like thinking about it and how like beautiful this book is. But like obviously I gave it five stars again. This is my fifth time reading it. And I was thinking like I really don't want the magic to wear off. I may not read it for a long time after this. I don't want to always remember every detail when I go in to read it again. And also talking about the TV show, that is one of the things that I really struggled with is their depiction of Clark. The way that they changed Clark into this like brash loud angry i think he's scottish and in the book clark is you know a skinny tweedy little british man who used to be a punk rocker like ugh, clark and miranda are my favorites so that's my reread of station 11 absolutely phenomenal if you haven't read this book yet and i know i just spoiled everything but like it is still worth reading even knowing everything that happened just for emily st john mandel's prose it is so worth reading and if you have read this but you have not read the sea of tranquility yet that is a very good comparison or very good like way to keep the emotions going keep the i don't know the sea of tranquility is the most similar book by her that has happened but like my love for this book is why i am constantly looking for other books that give me this feeling of i don't know humanity being worth saving of hope that things will persist that the world goes on so if you've got any recommendations for me drop them down below because i'm always on the hunt so thank you for watching if you like this video you could click that like button. You could subscribe, but really you can do whatever you want and I'll see you next time.